Hey guys, welcome to Remnant Radio. My name is Michael Roundtree. Joshua Lewis is out on a cruise, but that will not stop us from judging prophecies, but not in a judgy way. The scripture tells us to test prophecies in 1 Thessalonians 5, so we're going to obey that scripture, and we're going to test particularly prophecies from Destiny's Image. We have Patricia King, Kynan Bridges, and Tommy Ariami. Both of, all three of them have made uh, big predictions for 2023, so stay tuned. We'll talk some more about those. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Okay, this is the show for you. Hey guys, if you're used to Remnant Radio, if you've been blessed by our content, uh, we hope that you would consider uh, donating to us. As Josh says in the introduction video, we are crowdfunded. So you can make a one-time donation uh, on PayPal or a recurring one in Patreon. Just click on the uh, link in the description. Uh, also, consider hitting that like button, that share button. Help us to get that vid this video out there. We want people to see. Uh, our hope is to help uh, charismatics, Pentecostals, uh, and and just the the church uh, that that believes in the things of the Spirit to actually to obey what the Word of God says. And so we see there's this traditional divide between those who are all about the Spirit and all about the Word. And there is a way of bringing this together. That's one of the things we hope to do here. At Remnant Radio. So uh, today we're testing prophecies, uh, specifically the ones uh, that are posted by Destiny's Image. We talked about uh, Patricia King, kind of Bridges, and Tommy Ariami. Uh, all of them have big predictions for the year. Uh, before we jump into those, we're going to show some clips from them and then make some comments. Uh, Michael Miller, also known by some people as Hats, is in Denver wearing his traditional hat. Uh, but Miller, I kind of like the name Basement Boy for you a little bit better. So um, I think we'll stick with that one. How are you doing over there in the basement in Denver? Uh, dude, I'm doing good. Um, I just got a report from a conference I was a part of in Orlando this week that a female, get this, I gave a word about postpartum issues. People who've had babies and had uh, health issues after the fact. Uh, and a woman who had had uh, chronic hemorrhoids ever since having a child completely healed. How cool is that? Wow, dude. I mean, that's, uh, so that's, that's awesome. That's and a it, rare one. It took some, it took some guts for her to, uh, to come up and be like, yeah, bring right. my hemorrhoids. But yeah. I, I mean, the Lord showed up, paid yeah. off, right? Stepping out in faith like that. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, and also, Hey, we've got a conference coming up on the gifts of the spirit coming, uh, first weekend in March in North Carolina. We've got a few spots left. I think we've got maybe 30 seats left is that right michael i don't know something close to that uh, but uh i mean a week ago it was that so it's probably less it's booking up fast and uh and well in it we're trying to get a bigger so, venue hopefully so, we'll see yeah so we and uh i mean if enough people book soon enough we could get another venue uh we've already done this once so uh anyway exciting stuff e excited to it's, it's healing and deliverance is going to be the focus so we're gonna we're gonna have a good time together um well, hey, Miller, uh, is there anything you want to say to, to kind of preview this video before uh, before we jump in? I'm going to show the Patricia King one first, uh, but just to preview our time of, of testing prophecy and, and how we want to frame this. Yeah, of course. So, uh, again, part of the reason we do this is not because we want to be critical or judgmental. Like, that's not the intent at all. It's actually because we care a great deal about prophecy, um, but we also care a great deal about honoring the scriptures where it says to test uh the prophecies, right? It says, let two or three prophets speak, let the others pass judgment. And it seems mm -hmm. by and large in the charismatic 14. movement as a whole that there's a failure to do this very thing. So uh, like what uh, Paul instructs the Thessalonians, hold fast to what is good. Don't despise prophecy. Don't quench the spirit. Hold fast to what is good, but abstain from what is evil. So there's this sense in which when we actually listen to a prophetic word, we're supposed to you know, dig out of it what is actually from the Lord and what is not, and not to despise it when we find something that's not from the Lord. So... Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're doing. I, I always feel like I don't. Other people love these episodes. I don't love them as much. Uh, oh, and, I, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, and and the reason is, I mean, I feel this about myself. Who am I to judge? It's and I, I, the answer is nobody. I, I'm nobody. I'm just, a, I'm another human being made in the image of God, just like you. 
And so we don't consider ourselves special. We don't consider ourselves on a pedestal, uh, anything like that. Michael and I are both actively engaged in prophetic ministry, probably both prophesy over people on a weekly basis. Uh, so this is a part of our lives. We're not coming to at this from a cessationist angle. Uh, we're, we're coming as people who are actually going through it for it. And in my church, I, I, probably in yours, Miller, I don't know, but we prophesy from the stage every single week. We have teams of prophets. So I, I want you to know the angle that this is coming from. Uh, we're not throwing stones. And uh, and hey, just give it a listen. There might be some good things that we have to say, uh, as well as, uh, I don't know, we're just, what we say at Remnant Radio is we call balls and strikes. And um, and the scripture commands us to do this. And, and in the context of 1 Thessalonians 5, where it tells us to test prophecy, in that same exact context, it also tells us not to despise prophecy. And it's actually our love for prophecy that makes us want to do this, because here's what we find. What we find is if prophecy is never tested, it is despised. These go together. If people are allowed to just, you know, post, you know, their predictions over a year and every single year, like let's not put it on these three, just anybody. If if anybody is making the same predictions year after year after year or even different predictions, but they never come true, for they'll have plenty of followers because people just seem to like that. Just tell me my future. At the same time, they will have plenty of detractors who are saying, uh, you know, who are criticizing it and, and saying, like, you know what? I don't even believe in prophecy because look at how they do it. That's not prophecy. That looks more like astrology. We just, we just want to put a stop to that and just say, let's just do what the scripture says. By testing prophecy, we can help people love prophecy. And that's our desire. Mm-hmm. First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially to get to prophecy. So let's uh, let's listen to Patricia King. This is her prophecy, uh, again, posted by Destiny's Image, and, uh, and it is over the year 2023. Here it goes. If Michael can figure out how to click a button. There it is. So I want to give you four words that are going to build your faith for the new year so you can start getting excited now about what God is doing. And the first thing, I'm, all of these are visions that I've seen in prayer. So the first thing is that I saw the hand of the Lord moving on the generation of millennials and Gen Zs together. So the Gen Z generation is from about age 10 to 25 at this time. And then the millennials are from about age 25 through to about 42, 43 at this time. Okay. So that generation is what I saw in my mind. And I saw anointed leaders emerging. Even from some of the younger ones, I saw these leaders emerging who are going to move in power in the Holy Spirit. And what I saw on them was a conviction that the Holy Spirit was giving them toward love, faith, righteousness, and truth. And they were moving also in miracles, in signs, and in wonders. And I really believe that we're going to see an explosion of signs, wonders, and miracles in this new year. And some of these younger leaders that you're going to see, as they remain steadfast, immovable, unshakable, and faithful over the years, they're actually going to grow up to be generals in their generation. And they will be historical generals um, as we see the, the, the body being prepared for the coming of the Lord and the bride being prepared for the coming of the Lord. And I do see that as a fresh focus for the new year, this bridal love, this expectation for Jesus coming in power. And whether he comes to you know, um, you know, the the coming of the Lord, or if it's just his coming in a new season, we're going to be ready for him with oil in our lamb. The next thing that I saw was a grassroots movement emerging right out of the soil of the earth that is going to be Jesus focused. And that's what I saw. This company of millennials and uh, Gen Z's were in that company that was bringing forth this movement. And it was just like rising up right out of the earth. A grassroots movement is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me about. And he said that um, that uh, this uh, movement is going to be Jesus focused. So it might be, you know, similar to the Jesus people movement, but not right. It's going to have different elements in it. It'll have a different personality. But what's going to be the same is Jesus focus. It's not just about anointings or ministry or missions or whatever. It's going to be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And all that Jesus is, he's going to be magnified in this coming season. And so these anointed leaders are going to emerge um, uh, and 
Secondly, this three uh, this um, grassroots movement, similar to the Jesus People movement, but different. There's going to be a lot of conviction in that movement, and there's going to be a great harvest. And actually, the harvest has already begun. People are getting harvested. I have friends that have been preaching out on the street, and then people get so hungry they want to be baptized, so they're baptizing them in fountains right in the street. Or thirdly, rather, I saw a three-corded strand, and it was like this cord that was unbreakable. Now, we know that we have seen an emphasis on the prophets and the apostles over the last 25 years, 30 years or so. And that's that's been a defining by the spirit of the apostles and the prophets. But in this season, I see the evangelists becoming predominant. The evangelists are going to be becoming predominant, but they're not just like ordinary evangelists. It's almost like they have working in their DNA apostolic and prophetic threats. So it's like a three corded strand in these evangelists that will not be broken. It's going to be powerful because they're going to be very prophetic in their perceptions. They're going to be apostolic in that they're going to be able to build um, build. Uh, people in the faith, equip them and establish them in kingdom ministry is moving the gospel forward. But they're also, these evangelists are going to move in tandem with apostles and prophets. So we're going to see new uh, companies, and that's a word, uh, companies is going to be a word that is going to be highlighted in this um, next year. Uh, rather than networks or, you know, denominations and that, even though there's nothing wrong with those and there still be networks and denominations, but companies is going to be established. So people are going to be finding relationships. So there'll be the, the, the evangelists relating with the apostles and the prophets running in companies together for the advancement of the kingdom. And then the uh, fourth one that I want to share with you specifically today, I saw a plumb line of love coming down out of heaven into the earth. And you're going to see an emphasis on the love of God. And the Lord's been speaking to me personally about this clearly. And you probably heard about my book, uh, Live Unoffendable, which is part of that love mandate, is that God's raising up a people who refuse to be offended. <laughs> and so there's teaching on that in my book, Live Live Unoffendable. You can get that on patriciaking.com or on Amazon in different places. But um, this plumb line of love, you're going to see an emphasis on the love of God. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit's going to be putting a demand for the love of God to be made manifest, especially in his people. But then we're going to have a voice to then share that um, with uh, the nation or the nations and even calling people to account to be more loving. So we're going to see an emphasis on that in the midst of all the violence and the, the slander and the hatred and the ridicule. Everything that's out there. God is going to raise up a standard against it. And it's his plumb line where we base. That's what you're going to base your spirituality on is how well do you love? That's why it's a plumb line. Everything that we do and everything that we think needs to be aligned to that. Okay, so there you have it, Patricia King, Michael Miller. What do you think, man? Uh, I, on multiple levels, uh, on a personal level, do you think that she heard the Lord on, a, I mean, biblically, theologically, are things lining up? How do we go about testing this prophecy? How are you going about it? How am I going about it? That's a hard. <laughs> I mean, okay, let's start with this. It's a uh, millennial. I would technically be a millennial. I'm 41 as of uh, a week ago today. Um, so I would fit within the the top part of that. You don't let's, look a day younger. Start... I, I don't. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> uh, I mean, okay, so let's just go bit by bit through this. Um, the very first word had to do with that particular generation and leaders arising. Uh, I, here's the tough part about this, this whole word, there's no way to prove it right or wrong. Um, biblically speaking, I, I can't necessarily find anything that I'd go that contradicts the scriptures, except for maybe the be judged by love bit sort of, uh, although that could, there's truth to that. Um, Hold on. Why, a, why would be judged by love be contradictory to the scripture? What, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm just saying I don't know if if your ability to show love is the only means by which you are judged. Uh, I don't okay. think the scriptures it, actually tell us exactly all the means by which we will be judged. Okay. Well... Does that make sense? Yeah. But, I mean, I think one could make the case that... Um, the first and second commandments, everything is summed up by those. So in the end, are, are there other things that are that are relevant? The words that we use, uh, Jesus talks about being judged by those, um, you know, remembering the poor. The, the, I mean, 
everything kind of seems to come back to that. So I, I probably wouldn't um, make too. I wouldn't too disagree big of a with it. I was saying, but yeah. but I would say on that, and that was the fourth word that she that she shared. Like, there's going to be like this plumb line of love that comes down, and uh, and there's just going to be this huge emphasis on love. Well, certainly there should always be an emphasis of love in Christianity. It's kind of the cardinal of virtues and the uh, the consummate and summarizing virtues. So. Um, but like to your point, Michael, that would be hard to say, but I kind of feel like in the church, it's almost like overdone in a, in a way and not in the sense that like, you can't, you can't love too much. That's impossible. Um, but theologically speaking, this idea of like God is love has become so defining that God is no longer just, and that's a big problem. With well, that they're, said, they're, they're I don't miss defining love, right? In a lot of ways, they, they are. But with that said, I don't think she was suggesting. She certainly wasn't suggesting we shouldn't like preach the judgment of God or anything like that. So uh, anyway, the, I'm just just talking through it. But uh, keep going. I I think you had a, a more fulsome kind of uh, evaluation here. So so walk us through. Well, I, I'll, I'll point out. I, God willing, all of this is true. God willing that there are new leaders that rise up from both millennials and Gen Z. God willing, there is a revival that that looks similar to the Jesus People movement, where it's all about Jesus, not about people's various ministries, and that there is sort of a grassroots thing when it comes to these companies and and a plumb line of love. Like, uh, I, I, God willing, all of those things are true. The tough thing is, I can see every year God raising up new leaders because people are getting saved, and so I I could genuinely make up a word that could sound very similar. I could say, you know what, this year, there are going to be people who are going to get saved because there's going to be new people that are evangelizing. There are also going to be people who don't get saved and there's going to be a failure. Some people won't even hear the gospel this next year. Mm -hmm. um, the tough thing is giving those kind of words isn't helpful. Right. Um, I think for her, she thinks it's giving people hope, but I actually would say maybe Maybe some people listen to that and they're given hope, but it's not the kind of hope I would want to anchor my hope in um, because it it's not sure and there's right. no way to prove it. Right. And so that's the, yeah, the problem with of, of these words, just to, I mean, to your point on, on like, let's just talk about how testable is this. And, and, and part of the reason, I mean, this is relevant. How do you test prophecies if they're not testable? Like if they're always true, like if somebody was to say, um, some will live and some will die this year, you know, and I've, I've actually heard that uh, prophesied. If you say those kind of things, well, that that is always true. So you can't really test something that's going to be true anyway. And, um, and so let's just uh, actually, and, and one more thing before we walk through that is, you know, Jack Deere is the one who trained us in prophecy. And Miller, when you and I were starting out, it was very much like, um, especially when we started getting into ministering from the stage, he, he would just say like, listen, don't, don't do this. He would call, I think God loves you. Like, he just wants you to know, but, you know, don't do this like chicken noodle soup prophecy, I think is what he called it, where it's basically like you do stuff so general that nobody can test it. He said, take a risk. And he quoted his mentor, John Wimber, faith is spelled R I S K take a risk. Uh, that way we, we can actually test whether or not this is really a word from God as if it's true. And so we, we began to do that. So we have a passion for that, not just on personal prophecy, but on national prophecy. And it's actually even more important on that level. Um, so let's walk through, uh, she talked about, um, millennials and Gen Z ages, so ages 10 to 43, a, a move of God happening among them. To me, I don't think that's, that's not specific enough. Uh, that's almost every single person is 43 and under. I, I, don't know, half the I bet you that's more than half the population. Um, then we have, uh, there's going to be a movement of power, love, truth, an explosion of miracles. That is testable. Um, and Miller, I would say when she talks about a, a Jesus, something like the Jesus movement, that would be testable. It's one of those things that somebody can walk back if they want and they can say, well, there were a lot of people that got saved in Tallahassee and, you know, this month or whatever, you know, like people could say yeah, but the stuff. Jesus people movement was huge. It was huge. It was national, got media attention. We uh, called it the Jesus people movement because of how big it was. It, so it's recorded use those terms. In, right. It's recorded yeah. in history books. So. Just mark it down. Patricia King pre predicted a revival that is of that caliber. 
the kind of caliber that gets recorded in history books. Like I've studied the Welsh revival. I've studied the Azusa Street revival. I, I've studied these various revivals throughout history uh, because they're marked down as historical movements. And um, and so but that's what she's is- prophesying. So uh, I would say, Miller, that is testable. Would you agree with me? And no, because she says it's going to be like the Jesus people movement. And that doesn't necessarily okay. mean in size. She could say, well, when I meant, when I said like, I meant this. So again, she could always, you well, know. I did say she could walk it back. She, she could walk it back to your point. Um, she talked about a three chord strand, apostle, prophet, evangelists. They'll be raised up. Uh, is that testable? A plumb line of love. Is that testable, Miller? <laughs> he shakes his Sorry. head. Sorry. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish I, I again, I, I went and looked at Patricia King's website. I wanted to make sure that we were reviewing somebody who is Orthodox faith. And she just has the, the creed as her statement of faith. The Nicene um, creed. Specifically. The Nicene creed, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which I mean, I good on her. That's a, that's a good thing. She's saying she believes everything in that document. That's fantastic. Um, I think that, t- so, so here we are, somebody who's claiming to believe what I believe. I believe in the Nicene creed. Um, uh, but when it comes to uh, prophecy, I- I'll tell you this, man, if, if, if he can't test it, I wouldn't follow it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with you. And, and I think there's another standard, uh, another standard too. And uh, although even before I get to this next standard, I, I do want to say like when she talks about the, the rising up of the evangelist, I will just give my kind of observation that I've seen in the body of Christ Man, I have seen more evangelism than I've seen in a long time, uh, of a like a different like street evangelism. Um, my, I mean, in my church, we're seeing people get saved every single week. Um, and at my last church uh, that that I was at, kind of at the tail end in that last year, we were seeing a lot of salvations, and a lot of it came by street evangelism. Um, to your point, Miller, this would be really hard to test, um, but I'm just trying to show a little bit of of goodness here you're being more gracious i'm at that point you are you are and I, I i wish i was there i think i'm so frustrated and and i was last week when we did the other review which is why i don't like doing this i don't like feeling frustrated yeah <laughs> i'd rather stick to the things that I, i'm like good this is yeah. actually happening yeah I, you know you're like i don't like feeling frustrated i like to feel good <laughs> <laughs> that's true i don't I, yeah. i'm tired of this okay. kind of stuff i really am well here here's so. the other standard that i was mentioning and that is if a person is delivering national level prophetic words, I want to know what their track record is. Has this person uh, hit been on target before with national level words? Uh, even if they've m- maybe missed on occasion, have they apologized? Have they repented? Maybe have they taken a step back, sort of like Jeremiah Johnson did after he missed the Trump prophecy? So uh, I, I want to know kind of what the track record is. And Patricia King's been doing this year after year for many years. And so I just looked up 2022 prophecies. And um, Patricia King, for 2022 prophecies, uh, she predicted that there was uh, uh, in the area of land and housing, there was going to be a vast increase, a vast like acquisition, growth, renovation, just a huge increase in, in basically these kinds of assets. She didn't say this. I assume she meant for God's people, um, but I don't remember her saying that. But basically just lots of land. Now, on some level, and Miller, I'm curious what you think about that on a testing level, but I, I think that was kind of testable because I tested it. I, I looked it up because I'm also aware I bought a house in the last year and sold a house in the last year. I'm aware of changes in the market and the interest rates have gone from ground level historic lows uh, to getting up there a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I I know, and I've talked to real estate agents and, and read about the trends, like things look like, you know, some people are talking about a housing market crash uh, being around the corner. So I thought, okay, if, uh, if these kinds of land and housing, if there's a massive increase in these things being acquired, we should see this this kind of market just hopping, selling like hotcakes. And, and by the way, when she prophesied that, that was already happening. So I don't actually really like that. Um, but in 2022, things slowed down drastically. In 2022, uh, I looked at bankrate.com 
And in November, they noted a that the housing market or the housing prices have peaked, and that there is uh, and that there was a ten month decline in those kinds of transactions. And part of what also turned me off about that prophecy was she referenced Hebrew numbers. And, and Patricia King does this. She'll look at the the year. It's 2022. There are lots of twos. Uh, or she'll look at a Hebrew calendar and she'll say, based on this number, based on that. Uh, it feels a lot like the pagan practice of like, should we go to war or not? I don't know. Kill this animal. Open it up. Look at its guts. And, you know, some oracle reader comes along and says, oh, the guts say we should go fight. And that was the way the gods communicated. Now, I am not accusing her of paganism by any stretch. What I am saying is I'm uncomfortable with how close this gets to something that looks more like divination. Uh, it's not that. Hear me. It's not that. I'm just, I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with like, well, this date, it means that. Now, to, to show a little grace, like God can use symbolism in something like a date. You know, the day of Pentecost, the feast of harvest he pours out his spirit, and there is a first fruits of a global harvest in response to Peter's preaching. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm not going to call it divination. Like they, God can make connections and that kind of thing. But when you see this thing year after year after year, you start to say, okay, one, she missed the 2022 prophecy. I have not. I looked. I could not find. Maybe she did, but I, I, I didn't see it. Feel free to send it to us, and I'll, and I'll apologize. Um, I didn't see any apology from her saying, hey, I missed it. Like this was actually, you know, land and, and real estate actually uh, slowed down in the amount in which it changed hands, Christian or non-Christian, doesn't matter. It actually slowed down. It actually didn't move. So I, I, I look at the numbering system, which has never worked year after year. It's never worked and uh, looks kind of close to divination. I wouldn't call it that. And then, uh, but close. And then the, the fact that her prophecy was actually wrong. I just look at it all. I'm just like, I, I would not go to, uh, for all the wonderful things she probably does for our Lord Jesus Christ, I consider her a sister, uh, I would not go to her for prophetic ministry on a national stage to find out what God is going to do next in our nation or in the world. Miller, uh, what, would, what do you think of what I just said? I, I agree with you completely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it's close to divination. I would just say she's making connections that aren't there. Um, and because of that, she's there's a track record of making connections that aren't there. And for that reason, I wouldn't follow it. Um, and I think, quite frankly, she needs to own this stuff. This is the the issue we're seeing is a failure to be accountable to what you've prophesied in the past. Yeah. Um, one of the practices that we've always advocated for, especially in a local community setting, is that anytime we prophesy to someone, we ask their name, we record the word. That way, if there's anything that is not of God, we can be held accountable and make it right and clean up whatever mess we've made so much as it's up to us to clean it up. And so she has some mess to clean up. Okay. Well, hey, let's uh, let's go ahead and listen to the next one. This was this one is from Kane, uh, Kainan Bridges. Number one, the Lord spoke to me concerning 2023. And he said that 2023, the year 2023, would be a time of great deception. Deception would become a culture. There would be a culture of deception and that we must beware. We must beware of deception. I'm talking about deception in media, deception in the religious mountain, the church mountain, deception in the political mountain, deception in business. There would be deception in so many areas and that we needed to guard our hearts and our mind against deception, against deception. There would be such a strong push in the area of deception that people would literally lose their minds because of the great deception, people will begin to question their reality. I'm talking about the kind of deception that Paul talks about in Thessalonians. It gets into the area of delusion. The Bible says that he would send, uh, God would send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they would believe a lie. And it talks about deception. It would be a time where there would be a push for great deception. And if you are not on guard, if you are not sensitive, but more importantly, if you are not biblically literate, I need you to hear this. If you don't understand what the word of God says about various issues, whether it be about social issues, whether it be about moral issues, whether it be about relational issues, whatever the case may be, you would fall victim. If not careful, if you're not careful, you will fall victim to such a spirit of deception like we've never seen before. Please pay attention to this, because even though you, many of you say, well, that's already happening. No, you've never seen anything like this. 
beginning with the first quarter of the year, they, they would begin to monetize and systemize this deception, that it would be a systematic thing. And that if you're not really in the word, if you're not really in the word of God, if you're not really abiding in the truth, then, then you would be susceptible of, to this kind of deception. Okay, number two, write this down because this is so important. It's coming uh, in, in, in uh, the days uh, to come, in the days to come. Not only would it be a lot of deception, but there'll be a lot of distractions, a lot of distraction. Now, what is a distraction? A distraction is something that's meant to take your attention away from what's really happening. I'll give you an example. As we speak, they're talking about, you know, all these committees and they're talking about all these panels. But look at what they just approved. Trillions of dollars are being spent. Trillions of tax dollars, trillions of tax dollars are being spent right now. And it's being spent while people are distracted with other things. People are looking over here to the left, but pay attention to what's going on on the right. When they talk about food shortages, when they talk about wars, and, and, and you know there will be an increase in sort of the, the, the fear of global conflict. Not necessarily global conflict, but the fear of global conflict. Pay attention to what's really going on. Pay attention to what's really, really going on. Do not be distracted in this season. And that's why the things that God has shown you in dreams, the things he's shown you in vision, visions, but more importantly, what he has shown you in his word, lay hold on those things. Lay hold on those things. Do not let go of what God has spoken to you. The many of you, I'm telling you, God's going to do some things in 2023 that are very, very supernatural, that are very, very supernatural, but you must not be distracted. Stay focused on the word of God. Stay focused on what God spoke to you. Stay focused on God's promises and do not be moved by distractions. Do not allow things to distract you. Do not allow things to take your attention off of what God is speaking and doing in this season. He told me to warn you, to warn you against major distractions. And like I said, I'm going to be very specific. We're going to see it a lot in the political arena in, in the first quarter of the year, going into the middle of the year, where there will be many, many things that are said, legislations, committees, and panels, but they're all smoking mirrors. They're just a show. They're not, they're, they're, there's no substance to them. Don't be distracted by that. They're, they're designed, they've been strategically orchestrated to take your attention and your focus off of what you ought to be focused on, to take your attention and your focus off of what you should be concentrated on. Don't be distracted. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to fear. Do not give in to fear. Don't give in to the, you know, it's this distraction. Taking your attention off of what God told you. Taking your attention off of what God spoke to you. This is very, very important. And the coming year, and the Lord told me to warn you against this. Number one, warn you against deception. Number two, warn you against distraction. Warn you against distraction. And to warn you against, listen to this, disappointment and despair. The Bible actually says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For in my father's house, there are many mansions, many rooms. The writer of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, do not cast away your confidence, which has great, great recompense of reward. I'm telling you, you need to hear this. And I'm telling you this by the Holy Ghost. Do not give into the temptation in the upcoming year to believe that the things God has promised you have not come to pass. I'm telling the devil will try to play on you emotionally. He will try to make you think, you know what? I, I thought God was going to do this and I thought God was going to do that. And I thought he was going to do this and I thought he was going to do that. And none of it has happened. And the devil will try to use your disappointment to take you to a place of despair. That's why you give up hope. That's why you become hopeless. And in this next season of our lives, we must hold on to hope because hope is the anchor of the soul. It is the anchor of the soul. And this is why, beloved, the Lord told me to warn the church in this season, because as things begin to shift, as things begin to shift, you need to hold on to the truth and to the and to the firm foundation that God has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you, friend. He has not forgotten you. He is not slack concerning his promise. Maybe he told you that, man, by this time, but you know, by this time you would have you would have seen the restoration of your marriage. You would have seen that house or whatever it may be. Listen, do not let go. Don't do not see. Don't diss your appointment. Did you hear what I just said? I'm talking to somebody. Let me get off of here. Don't diss your appointment. So that's what disappointment is. That's when you diss or you distance yourself from your divine appointment. God has an appointment and God keeps his appointments. Even if it seems like he's not on the way, even if it seems like he's not showing up, even if it seems like it's not going to happen, do not diss your appointment. Do not become disappointed. Do not become disappoint, disappointed, friend. Do not give in to the overwhelming. I'm talking about you. This is a season where the devil will try to destroy people with disappointment. He will try to talk people into giving up, even to the point of taking their own lives, even to the point of seceding and conceding to the depression, that spirit of despair, that spirit of hopelessness that the devil will so engineer it. Now, there's many other things that I need to share with you about the upcoming year. The Lord hasn't released me to share them yet because there's a lot of things that God's going to be, be, be doing in this upcoming year. There's going to be great revival that happens, that begins to happen in churches. 
there's going to be another push, another push in terms of infectious diseases. Infectious disease will be one of the talking points in 2023, in 2023. But also there will be unprecedented miracles, unprecedented and documented miracles globally. We're going to see the church explode in the area of miracles, signs and wonders. But those are the three things God told me to tell you right now. Okay. All right, there it is. Miller, I'm going to summarize it, and then I'm going to start out by asking you, um, what are some positive things that you can mm. see in this prophetic word? Okay, so uh, summarize is really deception, distraction, and disappointment. Those were the three. This is a year of great, uh, of great deception, so hold on to your Bible. Make sure that you're biblically literate or you'll be deceived. Uh, don't be distracted. Uh, trillions of dollars are being spent and government's doing this and that. People are afraid of various things. Don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on God. Uh, God's going to do great miracles and focus on that and what God's doing. Okay. Uh, three, disappointment. I'm going to put disappointment slash despair as a single word. Uh, be careful about disappointment. Make sure that you're not giving in to disappointment, that you hold on to your confidence in God. The devil's going to cast a bunch of shade. All right, so that was basically the word, and it seemed like the end. And he's like, the Lord told me I couldn't tell you the rest of the big stuff that's happening this year. But then it, it was almost like a PS, like, uh, but there will be a great revival, and infectious disease is going to come back up again, and there will be tremendous miracles. So uh, I don't know. That, that seemed like it's three a quick more summary. words. That seemed like three more words to me. But uh, Miller, so that's the summary. Um, what's the positive. positive? What do you see that's positive. good in... Your brother in Christ. Okay, so uh, I I liked the beginning. If this was a sermon, I would have been like, "Preach it, brother. You got it. This is exactly what we need." He even to do. has he Go even ahead. has the alliteration going with the three Ds. Like, do you, right. are you living a three D life? Or are you just living in two D? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I I did. I mean, I, it, as far as like this is what a prophet in some level should do. He was calling Israel back to faithfulness to the covenant to their God and to the the word. Uh, and that's what he was doing, saying, listen, we're entering into a time of deception and you will be deceived if you are not very well grounded in the, the scriptures. I agree with that sentiment Amen. in a general sense. And he's even quoting about, you know, quoting from the scriptures about how there's coming a day of great deception. Um, so, I mean, in some sense, Paul prophesied exactly what he was prophesying. He's just kind of saying it's being fulfilled today. Like this year is, this is going to okay. happen. You're going to see this wholesale and even monetized. I thought okay. that was interesting. Um, well, okay, then, then what else, if we want to shift gears? Uh, what, what would you have some concern about? Well, my concern is that it's no way, to, like, again, it's, it's hard to test some of this stuff. A, a, a major explosion of revival and m the miraculous, okay, we can test that. If I don't see that happening in this next year, if that's not, like, something that's diseases. noteworthy. Yeah, right. If that's not something that's noteworthy, we can at least walk away and go, we could test that. Yeah, that, uh, that's why I was I was a little bit like, I felt the same way. I was like, oh, we can't test any of this, like uh, the deception. I mean, we, we already had like uh, a Respect for Marriage Act that was passed uh, that disrespected marriage. Like we're, we're changing language, everything. It, we, we have so much deception going on in our world that there's so much distraction. I mean, look oh, at my iPhone. I mean, I'm getting think text the... messages while I'm doing this show. Election. Disappointment, despair. Like the yeah. devil's always doing those kinds of things. So uh, you can you can't measure it. And then so I was like, okay, that's a not measurable word. But then he got to the end and he said, and there will be great revival and infectious diseases will come up and there will be an explosion of miracles. Uh, that's, that sounds more on the testable side. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, yeah, that's how I felt about, and I, I'm glad he said that because I'm glad he gave us something to which we could actually go back to. I will, again, I, I like this one a lot more so. I just, I can imagine, let's just take, this is just me imagining some person when you, who's when randomly When you say you in. like this one a lot more, what do you mean? Like you like this better than Patricia King's words? I did because there's so many things that are very scriptural about, scriptural about what he said. Like the idea that you're going to be deceived if you don't know the scriptures, drawing right. people back to the word. So th there's a lot that I like about that. And maybe that's just because I personally, that's, that's an emphasis I want to make in my own community which is why we go exegetically through a book of the Bible at a time so that people are well-founded in the scriptures. But, um, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought there. There was something about that in particular. Uh, yeah. uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay. Well, that that's fine. I, um, you know, one of the things I noticed, he, he mentioned the mountains, like the political mountain, and he named a couple of mountains. 
Um, you know, this is the seven mountain theology and uh, kind of dominionism. And it's always a little bit of a, a, a yellow flag, at least for me, when somebody's um, personal theology bleeds into their prophecies. And, um, you know, I, I I don't know. I don't love that. It's not like I would dismiss this uh, because of that. For that. I mean, I, I think for me that the big thing is this is this is not testable. Um, but I, I did do a review of of uh, his 2022 prophecies as well, I, and that theme came up again, dominion. Uh, this is the year of dominion, so the seven mountains theology. It's basically, hey, there's a mountain of government, there's a mountain of entertainment, there's a mountain of like the, a medical kind of mountain. There's, there are all these different kinds of mounts, seven of them to be specific. And until Jesus returns, we need to populate the seven mountains and take dominion over the seven mountains until Christ returns. So we're kind of readying the earth till Christ returns. That's seven mountain theology and uh, dominionism. And there's lots more to be said on that. We've done episodes on it. But um, anyway, uh, his prophecy for 2022 was this is a year for taking dominion, which is from that dominion sort of seven mountain theology um he says this you know before the church has just sort of survived but now we're going to thrive and uh he seems to be talking specifically about the church in the west because he says uh we'll begin to have influence on culture the church has lost its voice but in 2022 we're going to start feeling like we regained our voice and god's going to be giving us voice in government he's going to start giving us voice in entertainment voice in the culture influence in these regions and the church is going to look like it's thriving in 2022 where it was just surviving before um i think it's relevant has the person had accurate prophecies in the past and um miller based on that would you say that was accurate has the church taken dominion and uh, gone from losing our voice to regaining our voice specifically in the West and government and culture and movies and, and so on. Like, have we done that? What would you say? I mean, uh, it depends on where you're looking. In some sense, Christian media has actually become more popular. It's making more money. It's becoming more marketable. Uh, the Chosen uh, has been funded for another season, right? So we're seeing that kind of stuff happening in, in that mountain, so to speak, if you buy into it. Um so some level, yes, but then also if you want to look politics, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I mean, it just depends if you think that the you know, particular leanings of our our, our House, our Senate, uh, and our presidency, have we gained any political ground? I don't think so. Uh, I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, not. I, I don't think so. I did remember something I was going to say earlier. Uh, something yeah. I did like about this. I, I can, What I was going to say is I can imagine some random person going through a really difficult time this video coming in and they're going oh wow i shouldn't be disappointed i shouldn't let that get to me right. i i shouldn't i need to ground myself in the word and that might actually motivate them to do that very thing and it god could use it prophetically so to speak um all that say i could imagine that which is why i did like this word better that's one of the things i was trying to say yeah um anyway but regarding last year's word and this year's maybe yeah i mean the, the fact that The Chosen has gained popularity, I don't think is enough to say the church felt like it lost its voice, but now has regained its voice. Like, no, uh, I wouldn't like, go that far. That with couldn't it. be like a reference just to The Chosen, which was already out and already pretty popular. So uh, I think it has to have been more, especially because it, he touched on multiple mount, like having a voice in culture. Like, I don't think the world is like, oh, look at these Christians. They came out with the chosen man. They're encroaching on us in Hollywood. We're going to, you know, I, I don't see that kind of like. We certainly have it in education. Christian. What's that? I would say we've lost. Well, I'd say we've continued to lose our voice in education. There's a reason why certain ideologies are being allowed to be promoted. Uh, I mean, it. it I won't put my kids in the public school here in Denver for that very reason, because of what they're going to have to combat ideologically speaking when it comes to issues of gender, uh, sex, uh, marriage, all of those things. Uh, traditional Christian values in those arenas has been lost and that voice has been lost. Right. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't say in that arena, especially. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, Miller, would this be fair? Um the uh okay so roe v wade was overturned after many many, yeah. many years of struggling does this uh 
Do you think this would qualify as the church regained her voice because it was the year that Roe v. Wade was overturned? Um, Maybe in some level, but the problem is, is you got half the states doubling down. I mean, here in Colorado, you can have a an abortion up to the day of. There is no country in the world where that was normative. This is this is uniquely uh, evil. Right. Um, Yeah, and actually, the the uh, Respect for Marriage Act was passed as a result of uh, Roe v. Wade, an opinion from that decision in Roe v. Uh, in Roe v. Wade. Actually, is that right? Um, no, I think I'm not I sure. Said, yeah, I think I said that wrong. Anyway, okay. Forget but that. But the fact Forget is it I passed, and it's not exactly our voice right. behind it. Exactly. Right? Yeah, so, um, okay. So that's, uh, is there anything else to say uh, on kind of Bridge's word? No, again, I like his attention. I like his, to pushing people towards the scriptures. Uh, I, I would hopefully, I, I would suggest that's a word for every year and that we tell people you're going to be deceived if you don't know the scriptures because the yeah. scriptures say as much. Yeah, ex- except for the great revival part and the infectious diseases part and the miracles part. I mean, so that's a that's a real word. But, uh, you know, based on the history, I, I mean, I pray for revival, so I hope that it happens and I hope that he's right. Right, um, yeah. But... Um, yeah, do I think that like he heard from the Lord and he was supposed to say that and that, that we should bank on that? I, I mean, I don't think we should bank on it. Um, so I, I don't know, Miller. I'm in the same place as you. Uh, let's play. Well, this and, and let's just say, let's just say that there is a revival that does break out. Well, people have been prophesying that every year. Uh, I, I think, you know, I think of like the Kansas City um, prophets and some of the signs and wonders that took place to confirm some of these words. I think that's where at this day and age, that's what we need because these words are every year. Yeah. We, we get yeah, and you can, out, outburst of miracles every year. Yeah. And you can go back and watch our, uh, we did a whole series uh, interviewing with Sam Storms uh, interviews about, the, and he spent some time in Kansas City, close friends with Mike Bickle, uh, talking about the different prophecies, miracles, those kinds of things, bizarre things uh, in the Kansas City prophets. So uh, it was a popular series. You might want to go back and check that out. Uh, but okay, so let's uh, let's do this last word from uh, Tommy Ariami. Okay, so let's roll it. Just recently, more so about Texas, Arizona, and Florida, and he, he put it in order: Florida, Arizona, Texas. And when he said it, I heard the Lord say, "The fat is being restored back to the U.S." And we know the fat is uh, another word for the anointing. The Bible says, "The yoke shall be broken off of their neck, and the burden off of their shoulders, because of the fatness." And so the fat is being restored back to the U.K. The anointing, the glory of God through these three states: Florida. Arizona and Texas. The fact is being restored back to the land. And these three are going to be three king redemptive states that are going to not bow the knee to Baal. The Lord is referring to them. I'm not talking about every part of these places, but the large majority of these states are going to stand as representatives of a purity and a stance against spiritual wickedness. And so the Lord just started burning this word on the inside of me. And um, as he did, I knew I was already going to Texas, but then I got invited to Florida and Arizona, uh, Florida, especially after the word was given. And so um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the spirit of God will do in these places. But the Lord said that there was a move coming and with a shining light in Texas, there will also be a move of darkness to try and turn Texas into a goat state. But when the Lord referred to Texas, he did not refer to Texas as a state. He referred to Texas as a nation. And it really was a stand alone nation in the midst of the United States of America, that God was speaking about this nation, Texas, being a beacon and a representation of light that would stand on its own amidst the darkness of the other nations, and that God was going to use it, God was going to use its leadership to halt some of the things that the spirit of darkness is trying to do. I really saw Texas as the strong wall of the United States of America, that God was going to raise it up as a strong barrier and a strong wall during this time. And it was really a point for the children of God to begin to partner with him in prayer. But I also saw the eyes of the enemy were upon Texas as well. That even though God called Texas a redemptive nation, I saw the eyes of the enemy turning towards it. And I saw them working hard to plan, how can we turn this shining beacon of a nation into a cold and dark place? And so uh, the the United States uh, was really uh, being held together by some of the remnant that the Lord calls forth. And he calls uh, Texas that remnant. And the Lord said, for it will be the oil of Deborah arising. And I I really saw that the Lord was getting ready to raise uh, uh, what the world would see as a glitch in the program. God was raising another disruptor out of Texas. And this disruptor was in the form of a woman. And I saw I saw this woman negotiating for either the governorship or some high office in the federal government. And I saw her hanging in between the, the two, trying to figure out which one uh, was time. And uh, I really felt like the Lord was saying, this is going to be a female Deborah arising. And I heard the Lord say, for Texas shall say enough is enough. Texas shall be, again, God's remnant nation. And, and Texas will be a place where the enemy will try to claim it, hoping that 
the enemy shall say, if we can take Texas, we can take America. And I heard the enemy making a great boast. Let's take Texas, for if we can take Texas, we can take America. And of the truth, the Lord showed me that if Texas falls, America falls. But in the midst of it, there was in Texas, the ecclesia arising. There was a strong, unifying, fiery voice that was rising in the midst of Texas. And there was a contention that seemed to spill over into another move of God between old wineskins versus the release of the new wine and the new wineskins that God was going to reproduce out of Texas. And I moved over and I saw Arizona and the Lord said, watch as I turn your sand into a red fire. And I had no idea and Texas was or would be on fire. I don't, I've never been to, uh, sorry, Arizona. I've never been to Arizona before, so I'm not too familiar with it. But the Lord said, watch as I turn your red sand into a red fire. And watch as I sing a new song over you as I turn the desert into a pool of blessing. And suddenly you will say where the eagles gather that there shall be another river. And I literally saw a mass move of spiritual leaders to Arizona like eagles, and they were forming unions and strong bonds that would deal with uh, revival, but also would deal with politics, also would deal with corruption, also would take back uh, public schools and education, would also take back faulty prison systems, uh, take back abortion laws that have led to the deaths of millions, take back what little oil and gas that was there that the enemy said uh, that he was going to rob them for, and even create what looked like a competition, and this is something I saw today, between LA and Arizona for some kind of um, new solar form plants that the Lord was going to make Arizona the largest solar form competitor in the United States of America. And it was said of Arizona, this will light up America. And I believe this was speaking literally and not just figuratively. I saw that the Lord wanted to stir a revival fire from Arizona, but I also saw the enemy moving to do some uh, zoning or something with rezoning to try and uh, change different political catchments to favor itself. And I just felt like there was a strong resistance rising against something to do with zoning and something uh, to do with election integrity. And from the, nat the, the native Indian roots, the Lord said, I will rebuild broken down relationships. I will touch the hearts of native leaders to release the good of the land and redeclare it sacred, but unto God and not unto wolves and jackals. For this will be a day of the Arizona awakenings. For I will open its seven eyes and two only shall remain shut. And I really believe the seven eyes were speaking about um, seven, uh, uh, um, I guess uh, in UK, we call it counties. Here in Nigeria, I don't even know what we call it, um, but maybe region zones or counties that were going to be broken down into that um, seven would experience revival and two would stay cold. Florida, the Lord said, a champion has been anointed and in secret and shall arise from out of you a strange partnership of bedfellows. And for the Lord says, you will be a land of consulting and I will turn you into a spearhead of change. And Florida shall go up first and the spirit of leadership will suddenly spring forth from this place. Far from a grieving, there shall be a rejoicing and from a flag half mast shall be a new tall banner of hope. And all firm and teasing shall have a moment of ceasefire. And then suddenly the Lord says, an oak shall arise from you. And from the discontent of a nation, they shall say, enough is enough. And I really believe that uh, Florida was going to become a place of leaders arising. Amen. All right. Uh, there we go, guys. So uh, tell me, Ariami, and um, let me just summarize his words. Miller, um, I think you're going to like this one more because it's definitely testable. It's I, I already like it more. I like I'm I'm. There's for so many reasons. Yes, go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, so um, he talked about the anointing that breaks the yoke, the fat slash anointing that breaks the yoke um, being restored. And sp so that's a reference to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, I think it is, um, that uh, is commonly quoted by charismatics uh, to speak of a great anointing that's coming. Um, but he spoke specifically of Texas, Arizona, and Florida. And so uh, to re just read through these uh, these notes here. So in Texas, Texas is going to be like a beacon to halt the dark darkness. It's going to be a strong wall. Satan's going to launch a battle against it. But there's the oil of Deborah rising. There's a strong woman who's going to rise up as a, De as a Deborah in Texas and say enough is enough. As it goes with Texas, so it'll go with America. Whether we rise or fall as a nation, it's going to hinge on Texas. And uh, there'll be some kind of new wineskin, new move of God in that context. Arizona, um, he said the red sand is going to turn into red fire. Uh, so it seems to speak of some kind of revival. Uh, and he says uh, some kind of like a formation of eagles uh, will lead to another river. Something like that was, was his wording. Um, eagles represented leaders, he said, in politics, education, uh, in dealing with abortion laws, oil and gas. Uh, he even talked about uh, competition with uh, L.A. over some kind of solar energy. Uh, and he says, but the enemy is also going to, to bring his own sort of counter movement, but there's going to be an Arizona awakening of some kind. And then Florida a champion is anointed, um, spirit of leadership, Oaks arising, that kind of deal. So there's the, the super fast summary. Uh, Miller, give us your thoughts. I mean, I, I'd say this is, this is the most specific word that we've reviewed this year, um, by far. 
and we can test this stuff and good on him. Like this is, uh, you know, something we didn't mention about the last guy, but again, I did, I, I tried to look up the doctrines that these guys believe and that I can tell so far, there was no like heretical doctrines that they were adhering to that I could see. If anything, they were all Orthodox. Um, so we would consider right. these people brothers, at least right. by their declarations. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that I know of no practices that I would say are heretical either. Right. So. Yeah, and first, uh, first John four one to ten talks about testing the spirits, and there's a, a a doctrinal component to that. You can go back and read those. Uh, so we test false prophets by their doctrine. Uh, you could do the same thing with, uh, say, Deuteronomy thirteen. Um, you know, are they sticking with the law of God? Um, so we can test them by their doctrine. We can also test them uh, by their character. We don't have that benefit. You you can't know the character of an internet. Uh, somebody on the internet, M- Miller. Who, which well, which of these actually has like an internet church? Was it uh, was it Tommy? Yeah, I believe so. I have to look at the the notes again, Michael. I don't have them up in front of me, but I, I can say this: that they're all a part of networks where I don't think sin would be tolerated. Uh, at least, I mean, I remember Patricia King played a significant role in getting Todd Bentley um, uh, recognized for the sin he was doing and calling him out on it. So, and good on Patricia King for doing that. Right. And so, one of these is a part of a Jim. Not Jim Um I can't remember. Somebody's uh, New York. The guy's a, an author. Um, I, I have to look up the notes. But the fact is, I, I don't that I know of. They don't have any sinful practices, and I would be very careful to even imply that because we have no evidence of that. Right. So that we know of their orthodox. That we know of they're not in sin um, or leading other people into sin. Um, and I can say for this last person, this is the most specific word that I've heard, and most of these can be tested. We're we're going to be. I mean, I'm going to be keeping an eye out. And I, I kind of want to do some research on some of this, like when he mentions. Um, so there's some visionary elements to it as well that, that are going to require interpretation. And so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see some woman come out of Texas and some headline, you know, she's uh, enough is enough kind of thing. I mean, that would be right. that would be pretty, uh, I would say, prophetic and awesome if that were to be the case. And at least we can be on the lookout for those things because of this. Yeah. Uh, well, I did the same thing as before uh, with the other two, and I, and I looked at the 2022 prophecy for t- uh, Tommy, and um, he he got some pretty big ones right. Uh, he got uh, so war in he predicted war in the between the Ukraine and Russia, and uh, he predicted Russia was going to be like flexing and trying to expand its territory. Now, on some level, we can look at geopolitically; they've been doing that for some time, going back to Syria and a number of other. Places. I mean, just look at Vladimir Putin's activity that's happening. Uh, so, yeah, but this say, is worldwide news. Yeah, that he has but been flexing. he did mention specifically the Ukraine and seeing tanks and Russia and invading, attacking that kind of thing. I think he mentioned Georgia also, and I don't think they've done that recently. I mean, they did many years ago. Maybe they did, but uh, anyway, Ukraine he predicted, and uh, this his video came out kind of at the end of 2022. Could have been that. Uh, it was definitely before the Ukraine war, which erupted in... Uh, At the end of 2022 or end of 2021? Sorry, 21. Uh, okay. But in February of 22, uh, the Ukraine was invaded by Russia. So he specific. landed that. He also got um, India and China uh, being at war. And and now the word war is a strong one. There have been There's skirmishes. Different kinds of words. Economics yeah, but uh, so it depends school. on what he meant by that and what people mean by that when they use it. But um, there was an outbreak of of violence and uh, of a military nature in uh, India between India. I looked it up between India and China in December. Uh, I didn't even see that. Now India and China are always kind of like going back and forth, but you know that happened, and so I, you know, we could possibly say give him props for that um then i was also looking at he says you'll be surprised by a liberal mayor in new york he said that of that that will happen in 2022 um i don't i tried to find a headline for something that would be surprising to me from a liberal mayor in new york it certainly wouldn't be a surprise to have a mayor who is liberal in new york but um but something noteworthy i couldn't i couldn't find anything noteworthy if you guys find something send it in um, he also put in their revival in America that did not happen. Um, so, you know, I think he got a few right and I applaud him for, uh, for stepping out Taking there. Risk. Yeah. Um, it seems like he might have got a few wrong so with the revival. I would say he did get that wrong. And I mean, there's always this definition of terms. I mean, we see this year after year, Michael, like someone say, well, there was a revival because, you know, in this little spot, there was. This yeah, but outbreak. if you don't quantify it, 
There's no way to prove it right, right. or wrong. So like, that's, part of those that's our whole point. Like if on the front end you say things that that are general enough to be reinterpreted to mean anything, it's not a prophecy. So when we hear revival, we're thinking about things that are recorded in history books that people are going to study in 50 years and 100 years. So um, that didn't We think of Brownsville revival. We, so, we look at those um, things and we and, name and them. And I would say that uh, if any of these three are watching uh, that we reviewed, we, we invite you. You could actually you could come on the show. We'd interview you. And, uh, and feel free to, to push back a little bit. We've actually done that. We, we reviewed some of Chris Reed's words uh, before, and, and he came on because he— he had said in one of his dreams that he thinks the apostle John is still alive somewhere. We kind of talked through that. And, um, and so anyway, he came on the show. We're, we're nice. <laughs> we love you. And uh, we had Isaiah Salvador come on the show too. Yeah, after we Isaiah had Salvador came on the show stuff. after we reviewed and, and had some critiques, but the, we were trying to make them loving critiques and he felt welcome to come on. And so and he, he's, he came on since he's kind of become a friend of Remnant radio. So, uh, anyway, so we encourage you if, if this is you and you're, you're listening, watching, please feel free. We, you have a, an open invitation to render radio. We'd love to, to have you on. And if you felt like you were mischaracterized in some way, we, I, I don't think we did, but, uh, anything's possible and we would love for you to, to clear things up. And, uh, we're, we're hoping to portray everything accurately and lovingly and obey the scripture. And there, the, that's already like a lot of hoops to jump through. So we're, we're trying to do our best. We welcome you to, to kind of push back. Or even if you're one of their fans and you think that we were wrong on something, you're feel, feel free to uh, to let us know that. Uh, Miller, is there anything that uh, we're, we're kind of rounding out here, our one hour time frame. Uh, is there anything that you would want to add or take away or <laughs> take away from anything that we've said so far? Uh, no, I mean, I just, again, my personal excitement over that last one, there's somebody that took some really, I mean, Granted, we want people to share what they feel like the Lord has shared with them. But if what you're sharing on a public platform isn't specific to where it can't be tested, that's a problem. And I got to say kudos to uh, our last uh, review. I, right. I'm actually looking forward to evaluating that and coming back next year and saying, hey, this might be somebody to watch um, in yeah. a good way. Because that's well, actually, that's my intention. I want to see prophets in the land. I really do. That's what yeah. I want. Right. But Miller, um, what, what would you say about this? Because I... Um, are, should we just stop the practice altogether prophesying about like what's going to happen in the new year? Like, is that a good practice, a bad practice? I mean, obviously prophets in the scripture predict what happens, but it seems to have like a, an aim of some kind. Um, for instance, if it's, uh, Agabus predicting a famine that's going to come over the entire Roman world, Acts chapter is it 11 or 13, I think it's 11, uh, it leads to a response of like, oh, they're taking up offerings from different churches and saying, okay, let's, we're going to provide for the poor. So like it's leading in a specific direction. Um, I, you know, on these, to be fair, they, they did tend to, to move from a prophecy toward an exhortation, like therefore place your hope in God, therefore be rooted in scriptures. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Like I, I'll just speak for myself, I, I have mixed Miller. Feelings. If there's yeah. if there's an exhortation that it like because God is because my sense is that God is saying this, therefore we need to do this, um, and it, and it's something specific, not just like make sure you love people. Like we we need to do that anyway. Uh, but in the Acts eleven context, like make sure you give an offering to the churches that are going to be in great need really soon. Like there, there's a concrete action. So I would say, if let's not do global prophecies that are merely for speculation. Let's attach it to like the the application. You know, we talk about this sometime: revelation, interpretation, application. Like, what do we as Christians do with this? Because otherwise, I mean, I, I, it can get to where we're just throwing mud on the wall and seeing what sticks, or it can it can get to starting feeling like uh, Christian astrology. Uh, how does this affect me as a child of God and obeying Him and and pursuing Him? That's what I want to know. And um, so I would just encourage if we're going to share those kind of words that we do it in that context. And, and also, um, we've done a lot of reviews, Miller, on Deuteronomy 18 and, and just kind of unpacked precisely what that means and how one should interpret that about, you know, do you stone a false prophet? Do you not? Um, and, and so I don't want to, like, unpack that all again. Um, basically, we, you know, our understanding is that a, a, prophet, a prophet can miss a prophecy without being called a false prophet. But Deuteronomy 18 does seem to reflect someone who's sort of a national level prophet, in this case, sort of a, a Messiah poser in their context. But uh, 
there is a higher level of accountability for national level profit than somebody who just prophesies over a single individual. Just like I think there's a higher level of accountability for somebody uh, who's preaching to 50,000 versus somebody who leads a, a house church of 20, right? I, I mean, they, they're both accountable before God, but there's a difference in terms of like the, the level of, of scrutiny uh, and, and accountability. And so I, I think that if people are going to uh, with these prophetic words specific, like if we're going to share these words, we should feel to fear the Lord. We should have fear and trembling before we share it. And if we're wrong, we should own everywhere in which we're wrong. And honestly, if, if we're, if we're kind of wrong a lot, we really shouldn't do that again. And, and maybe even if we're wrong, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to put an amount on it, but um, it, it's, it's really something that we need to fear God about. And, and I would say definitely repent. Like, don't just say, like, acknowledge you missed it and say, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I think I would say that. Miller, do you agree with me? Uh, on most of that, uh, the only thing I'd push back on is um, the idea that it has to have some tangible application, like take up an offering for a particular place. Um, because sometimes the application is just simply this, letting people know that God is sovereign and that there's still a God that speaks to a nation. Yeah, uh, and that that has application. It, it brings security to the people of God to know that God is still revealing uh, what's going on to the prophets in the land. So, um, and, and the other thing I would say, and maybe where I push back also is that everybody lives on a on a calendar and uh, on a cycle. And so, for a person to give a prophetic word for the year of whatever, I find it suspicious. But at the same time, I can also understand people sort of resetting their year, taking time to focus on God, listen to Him, and you know, share what He feels like God is sharing. So, yeah. th I think there is room for that. I, I do find it a little bit suspect, though, yeah. especially uh, the numerology stuff. Like, this is the year of this because it's 2023. Like, I, I don't buy that. Don't listen to that. That's yeah. not good. Yeah, I I think that's fair pushback. I think on the, um, I'm probably in the exact same camp as you. Like, I I wouldn't say it's totally wrong. I would just say I'm a little suspicious of it, uh, prophesying over the year. Uh, on the first one, I, you know, when I think of like when Isaiah is prophesying, like, hey, you know, Cyrus is going to be raised up. To your point, it's uh, so he's predicting specific things that are going to happen, and it is to show that he's sovereign, to show that you right. know he uh, he's the one who controls the future, and not us. And so that that is a, a routine. Uh, we would like to see some applications. Yeah, but even yes. with that, I would say God is doing this so that people will place their hope in him, and that becomes sort of its own expectation. And maybe that is their expectation. And and I would say, again, to be fair, I think they usually, I think all three of these in their prophecies did have some kind of exhortation that went through it, uh, went with it. Yeah. But anyway, uh, well, those are, those are our thoughts, and uh, I hope you liked them. And if you didn't, I'm sure you'll let us find out in the comment section. You always do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, guys, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you wouldn't mind considering donating to Rimna Radio, helps us pr continue to produce these videos and get them out there as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, so you can see all that information in the description for, uh, for this video. And I uh, look forward to seeing you guys next time. God bless you all, and have a great week.